Can Soft, our lone wolf solo fighter from the last video, continue her onslaught in Act 2 on the hardest difficulty and make it to Act 3? She sure can, and she does it with a bang too, but I won't spoil too much. If you haven't seen the Act 1 video, go check it out here. I'd highly recommend it, not just for the context of the build, but we also go over all my self-imposed rules at the beginning. So if you're wondering why I'm not using a specific strategy or mechanic, that'll explain it. With that out of the way, on to the main part of the video. We arrive in Act 2 in the Shadowcursed Lands after our ordeal in the last video more prepared than ever before. The Shadowcursed Lands, however, have an apt name, and there's plenty of creatures throughout the area that meld with and are empowered by the shadows, so most of the time we'll have the Light Cantrip active on our weapon to make them less effective. Our first fight happens when we come across a group of harpers near the entrance to this area, who are set upon by shadows. And not the lack of light type of shadows, but rather the vaguely humanoid shaped monsters that sap your strength while weaving in and out of the light kind of shadows. Soft, of course, cannot let this stand. Being the hero she is, she jumps in to try and save the harpers and the fight kicks off. The fight starts with some chunky damage. We use Hunter's Mark with our bonus action to use our first attack to throw the trident and deal darn near 40 points of damage. And as our weapon returns to us, Ooh boy, our first throw related bug. That's right folks, a minute into the video and we've got one for the bug counter. The way this bug works is that sometimes when we throw our weapon, the light can strip on it kind of just turns itself off. But only sometimes, and then it also sometimes turns itself back on when we throw it again. Normally this wouldn't be so bad, but this is very much so an act where light matters. To the point where if we don't have a light on us, we might take damage at the start of every turn in certain areas. Not to mention, most enemies in this act get resistance to our damage types if they're not in light, so in short, fun! Thankfully this isn't a terribly hard fight, so even despite this bug we're able to get by with our usual strategy. We apply Hunter's Mark with our bonus action and whatever we're focusing, burst down with a couple throws, and rinse and repeat. We do take a few hits along the way, but with the warm bodies that the Harpers are providing, our enemies have their aggro split to make this fight even easier. The only really scary part about this fight is that shadows can drain your strength if you fail a save, but we managed to get by without failing any of these saves. Unfortunately, the Harpers are kinda mega booty, like most NPCs who join us for fights. And they don't make it easy to save them at all. We end up losing one before the fight is over. Either way, before too long we manage to take out the shadows and the leader of the Harpers tells us about a safe place where the darkness can't reach us. She marks it on her map and warns us to keep our light going, though that really doesn't seem up to us very much with all these bugs going around. We arrive at the refuge the Harpers mentioned, the Last Light Inn. They don't take too kindly to us here at first, but the Harpers that survived as well as a tiefling girl we helped in Act 1 both speak up on our behalf, so they decide not to murder us on the spot, which is very cool of them. And after being led inside, we go right to our first couple item power-ups for the act. Number one on the list is the Amulet of the Harpers. This item gives us advantage on wisdom saving throws, as well as lets us cast shield once per short rest for free. This will be a solid staple of the build for a while to come. I'm a bigger fan of number two on the list, however, the Cloak of Protection. A cloak that gives us plus one to our EC and saving throws. A simple item that boosts our survivability by a ton especially considering we don't have any other cloak items to compete for that equipment slot. After that, we leave the last light in and head elsewhere in the Shadowcursed Lands to search for a way to resist the ill effects of this place. During our search, we come across a drider, that's a half-drow, half-spider by the way, if the name didn't give it away, who's got a glowing moon lantern that allows him and his allies to resist the Shadow Curse. Naturally, we decide we need that for ourselves and set about taking it. During our first round of combat, we hop onto the top of a building for some high ground, because we do a bunch of extra damage that way since our weapons deal extra crushing damage as they fall, and we have an increased chance to hit. We get to thinning out the herd since the main way we can still lose at this stage is by getting overwhelmed by enemy numbers. One of the enemies gets a little confused by me being above them, but they've definitely got the right spirit. On our turn, we decide to help them out and finish what they started since we're such a good gal and all. The weaker enemies get dealt with fast here, with each of them taking no more than two hits to take out. Pretty soon, it's just soft and the drider left, and this dude is tanky with a capital T. He has multi-attack and hits like a veritable truck when his blows do land. I try kiting him to get out of melee range because our chance to hit with disadvantage is abysmal. And before too long, we're completely drained of our spell slots, which means no more shield either. Right as things start to get dicey, we lure the drider over to the edge of the roof. We shove him off and... Holy frijoles! 91? Points of falling damage? Uh, well, okay then. I'm not one to look a gift drider in the mouth. And with a couple more throws with our high ground bonuses, the drider is swiftly dealt with. 
Now that our enemies are done for, we go investigate the moon lantern the Drider was carrying around, only to find out it's got a captive little pixie inside of it. Since Soft is such a good person, she lets the pixie go, and upon seeing the angelic face of her savior, the pixie is so gracious she gives us a magical bell that protects us from the shadow curse. And with that, nowhere in Act 2 is safe from Soft. We get going in the direction of our next big item that I'm very excited about, and along the way find a toll house being guarded by Jiren Goth Thorm, a nutcase lady who's been revived from the dead and has taken up residence in the toll house as his new collector. Thankfully, Soft has no qualms with manipulating the mentally unstable, and with two nat 20s in a row, without any saves coming either, we convince Garen Goth Thorm to explode into a pile of gold. And, as a side note, we also got another nat 20 on our next roll to open a safe in the toll house, and like, what are the odds, really? Then we continue up the road a little bit more and come across a pretty uninteresting fight. It's just a bunch of shadows and undead harpers, and nothing particularly interesting happens. We get hit like two times throughout the whole thing, and the enemies don't really stand a chance. Something interesting does happen after we take them out though. Standing just a bit further up the road is Arabella, the tiefling girl we saved in Act 1 from the mean druid lady. She shows off some cool druid-esque powers she seems to be awakening to, and tells us she got separated from her parents somewhere in this area. We tell her we'll find them, and then... I, I just forgot about this, I'm not gonna lie. This, this never comes up again. We do tell her she can hang out in our camp, though. And further up the road still, we come across everyone's favorite devil, Raphael. He shows up to remind us how bad our graphic settings are, as well as ominously imply that something super duper bad is hanging out inside the Thorn Mausoleum that he's just chilling outside. Unfortunately, he refuses to give us any clear answers about what the heck he's going on about, and he just dips after we have the audacity to ask. But at last we've made it to the location we were looking for. Right next to the mausoleum is a small cove where some fish people are hanging out. Unfortunately for them, they've got something soft wants, so they've gotta go. We start setting up to find a good position to start the fight at, and after a fair bit of looking for the right spot, we settle on the ground right in front of them. Go figure. We throw our weapon at the Fishman Chief, and he just kinda takes it on the chin. Mad respect, honestly. Not knowing what to do after that flex, we just walk up to get his attention. A fight starts, but wait, what? It's just me and him? Uh, okay, sure, why not? For the record, there's a lot of other fish people in these bushes, and I have no idea why they didn't join the fight, but they just kind of leave their chief to die. Rather quickly, in fact, too. As we approach to loot the body, we notice the other fish people and get ready for a much bigger fight. As we prep to fight them, they all make themselves known when we cast Hunter's Mark, but they still just hang out in the bushes, unfazed by the literal death raining down on them. So we do what any mass murderer, I mean adventurer, would do in such a situation turn into a one-man firing squad, and mow them down as they stand there. This takes quite a while with how many there are. If we had to fight this honestly, I'm sure it would have been a bit more on the challenging side just due to sheer numbers, even if these guys kind of suck. Eventually, either way, it gets to the point where we can't land a throw on any of them due to terrain getting in the way, so we set about slaying them the old-fashioned way. When the fight starts proper, we go straight for the chief again. Kind of weird they add two, though this might have been because that first one bugged out and he goes down fast with an action surge. The rest all spend their turn just moving towards us, and back on our turn we jump up to some high ground and the rest of the fight is over soon after, with the old 1-2 hunter's mark throw combo. With the fish folk dead, we can at last claim our prize, and two of them at that since there were two chiefs. The Lightning Jabber. This plus one spear deals 1d4 extra lightning damage innately, and another 1d4 lightning damage when thrown, for a whopping extra 2d4 on all our attacks. In addition to that, it can also occasionally shock enemies which prevents them from taking reactions and gives them disadvantage on any dexterity related dice rolls. You can bet your bottom dollar that we will be using this weapon for the rest of the run, even still occasionally by the end of Act 3. With weapon in hand, we at last infiltrate Moonrise Towers to learn more about the Cult of the Absolute. Upon entering the towers, we find Kethric Thorm, one of the three chosen leaders of the Cult of the Absolute. And as we wonder how we're gonna take him out, this goblin beats us to the punch and the day is saved! Oh, shoot. Never mind. That's... that's my bad. Spoke too soon. Dude's immortal. After that eventful welcome, Kethrick just meanders off to enjoy the view from the roof, and we speak to his right-hand person who tells us there's a super duper important relic that is somewhere in the mausoleum, and Balthazar, Kethrick's bestie, has been inside the mausoleum for a while looking for it and they would love to entrust us, a total stranger, with the recovery of said super duper important relic. 
With destination in mind, we quickly get sidetracked into a derelict mason's guild that's purportedly loaded with enemies and secret rooms. We're mostly looking for the former though, since we're so close to leveling up. And upon entering the basement of the guild, we find exactly what we're looking for. Enemies. Most of these enemies come in the form of the generic shadows that permeate this act, but one of them is a wraith who douses any light near itself with an aura and can also drain our max HP should we fail an admittedly easy con save. Thankfully, our light spell seems unaffected by this aura and the wraith walks right up to us and with our 90% chance to hit, even with this advantage, as well as an action surge, this bozo gets shredded by our brand new jabber on our first turn. All that's left is the regular shadows, and we know how that goes down. With our AC being as high as it is, plus the reeling from our adamantine shield and the shield spell itself, the shadows only land one hit on us. And we just stand point blank in front of them and yeet the jabber into their faces until they're all done. And right as the last shadow falls, we hit level 6, which gives us another 8 max HP, and since we're a fighter, a brand new feat option as well. And after a bit of deliberating between Heavy Armor Master for extra tankiness, and just a plus two to our strength score, we end up going with the plus two to strength. Can't go wrong with that improved modifier, especially with Tavern Brawler as our first feat choice. Now that we're level six, we get sidetracked even more, and head back to the last light end to have a long way to chat with the leader of the folks here, Jahira. She tells us the Cult of the Absolute is infiltrating Baldur's Gate itself, and to root out that problem, Soft needs to start by dealing with Kethric Thorm. She then tells us to go speak to their resident cleric of Salune, Isabel. Isabel's been protecting the entire Last Light Inn with just how cool she is, and if anything happens to her for any reason, everyone in here will die. Good thing nothing bad could happen to her on the exposed balcony she hangs out on. We have a nice little chat with Isabel who gives us the blessing of Salune to be able to walk around the Shadow Cursed Lands, but this is pretty much just a worse version of the blessing we got from the Pixie, funnily enough. We say our farewells and, oh no, someone evil just flew onto the exposed balcony where Isabel likes to hang out. Whatever shall we do? That's right gang, time for another big fight. And this time it's Flaming Fist Marcus and his fiendish goons who have shown up to try and take Isabel back to Catherick versus Soft. And we're the only ones who can save her. Mostly just because everyone else in this inn sucks doo doo, mind you. Thankfully, right before I recorded this, they buffed up Isabel's health. Uh, but she still gets surrounded immediately before we can even take a turn. We do our best to focus down Marcus in the hopes that we'll cause the goons to run away, but even though we obliterate him with our jabber and action surge, the goons remain. We down a potion of speed too since we're gonna need to kill these guys fast to keep Isabel alive. Isabel, however, has very little interest in staying alive, and the first thing she does on her turn is provoke an attack of opportunity for no reason. She does admittedly heal herself a bit after, but I mean, come on, Izzy, a little more self-preservation wouldn't hurt. And before we get another turn, the goons wombo combo her with a hit and a crit, and she's down just like that. Not wanting to lose access to our temporary allies, and more importantly, the merchants that live with them, we decide to reload and try again. The second time starts off much better as we get a turn before she gets surrounded, though she does see to it that it's not too easy for us by provoking an attack of opportunity which crits just so she can run into striking range of one of the fiends. Very cool, Isabel. On our turn, we Hunter's Mark Marcus, Hunter's Marcus, yeet the jabber, and gosh darn, get the crit of a lifetime. With our follow-up throw, Marcus goes down, and we don't even need to action surge. We do, however, use our action surge to finish off the fiend that Isabel is standing next to, and we close the door and stand in front of it to try and prevent the others from getting to her. And her from getting to them, for that matter. Our plan works, and a whole round goes by without Izzy unaliving herself. Unfortunately, on our turn, we made the mistake of leaving the door to thin out the demonic horde. We take one out in the process, but leave Isabel defenseless, which results in two of the goons dashing to surround her. Back on our turn, we take them both out with one throw each with our new absurd damage, and with that, all is not lost. In fact, it's pretty much won. One more fiend flies up to try and pull something funny, but we take it out on our turn, and the fight is over! Victory is ours! I was honestly expecting this to take more than two attempts, so I was pretty proud of how we did this. Now that the inn is safe, we head back to the Thor Mausoleum and enter it for the first time in search of Balthazar. There's a bit of a puzzle at the entrance to enter the underground part, and to find the answer we have to read books. But Soft ain't no nerd, so we press buttons until we figure it out. 
Unfortunately, this ends up triggering the trap in the puzzle room, which just makes black fog, I guess. Uh, I don't know if something else is supposed to happen or what, but yeah, this is it. Either way, we just try again, and the door to the Gauntlet of Shar opens on our second attempt. As we enter the first room of the Gauntlet of Shar, there's another puzzle that involves turning off the lights to find the right path so we can press the button at the base of the statue in the center of the room that unlocks a door deeper in. But once again, soft ain't no nerd, so we just solve it the old-fashioned way, by walking around blindly until we find the right path. And we learn that if we approach from the right and then circle around to the front of the statue, we can approach the button. When we enter the next room, we meet some friendly skeletons being controlled by Balthazar, who warn us about making too much noise, otherwise some baddies are going to show up. And as they're saying this to us, some baddies show up. The baddies show up by manifesting out of black holes, which keep spawning more if we don't take them out. So on our first turn, we take out one of the baddies, who will have pretty run-of-the-mill regular guy stat blocks. Then we action surge and take out two of the black holes. Uh, umbral tremors, if you prefer. Our enemies really don't stand much of a chance hitting us, and just to make things extra easy for us, we've got a couple cold bodies acting as decoys. The last umbral tremor does summon one more guy, but we're not stressing. Back on our turn, we destroy the umbral tremor and kill one of the other fellas with a well-placed hunter's mark throw combo. The rest of the fight goes by with the enemies missing us over and over, and we pick them off one by one without them landing a single blow. We follow one of the Skelefriends to where Balthazar is hanging out, but before we can enter the room where he set up camp, everything begins to shake and turn dark, and this guy calls us mean names. Some more basic baddies show up alongside a bunch of umbral tremors, and another fight starts in full swing. This fight plays much the same as the last fight, just on a much larger scale. Just like the last fight, we have a few friendly skeletons to help us at the start, and just like the last fight, we prioritize taking out the Umbral Tremors before they can spawn hordes of enemies. Unlike last fight though, the Umbral Tremors themselves spawn on the second round too, for a total of 8 in this one encounter. And if we don't take them out, they each summon, I believe, 2 or 3 guys before despawning. We do eventually manage to thin down the Umbral Tremors, but we fail to take out all of them before they reach their summit limit. So the initiative order just ends up a, a little skewed against us. But action economy be darned. Who needs it when we've got AC and damage out the wazoo? The rest of this fight is long, and when I say long, I mean long. This fight took us roughly about 30 minutes total, not just because there was a lot of enemies, but most of them can attack us twice as well. Adding on to that, some of them also have resistance to our damage due to their living shadow feature, which our light cantrip would get rid of if it didn't bug out. And it gets even longer once we lose concentration on our Hunter's Mark, and with it that extra bit of damage. We use all of our spell slots on shield as the fight goes on, since otherwise the occasional attack would land, and thankfully by the time we run out of spell slots we're able to thin down the herd by quite a lot. After that, there's little else for us to do but keep yeeting the jabber like there's no tomorrow, until one by one the enemies fall down, and it's just me and this guy left. Unfortunately, to make matters worse, the corpses were making invisible walls on the ground wherever they died, so we couldn't actually hit this dude with our spear, since his dead buddies were protecting him. Wanting to finish the fight with a throw, we compromised and just yeeted him into the ground instead. Upon finishing the fight, we meet Flesh, and more importantly, Balthazar. He interrogates us a little about who we are and how we found out about the Night Song, but seems pretty satisfied when we tell him we're some random gal that walked up to Zarel, and that's also how we found out about the relic. After putting his suspicions to rest, we ask him if we can have some help clearing the dungeon to come, and after passing a persuasion check, he gives us a bell to summon Flesh, who, it turns out, is his brother. We love supporting family businesses. We want flesh for two reasons. Number one, we're going to need all the help we can get for this upcoming fight, and number two, it's going to be a lot easier for us to deal with Balthazar without flesh there. Now that we've got a lot more than just a pound of flesh waiting on the sidelines, we go to our next big fight, Yurgir, his Displacer Beast, and his Maragons. Yurgir is a powerful devil and the danger that Raphael was alluding to when we spoke to him last, but I'm feeling more than confident in our ability to take him out. I mean, how hard can he be, really? We carefully sneak up to the invisible Yurgir trying to spot him with our eye that we got from Volo in the last video. Unfortunately, we can't seem to spot him, so we sneak a little bit closer in case that helps, and... Oh. Oh no. Wait, are those bombs? Wait, 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 Yurgir, we can... Okay, maybe this fight will be harder than I thought. 
Our second go around we managed to spot all of them while we're sneaking up, so we start the fight by hunters marking your gear and all of his goons get surprised. But it seems your gear is immune to the condition, so he throws some bombs at us then runs up and stabs them like a madman. Thankfully we survive the explosion this time and even maintain our concentration. On our turn we summon flesh to hopefully act as a frontline distraction and we fire up the old yeetin machine and your gear just melts under it. As he's melting, he does toss out a bajillion bombs though before we get our last throw in. Still, he dies hecka quick. Flesh does a good job jumping into the group of enemies to start distracting them, and back on our turn we heal up a bit and start sniping the enemies from our max throwing distance to keep away from the bombs. While most of the enemies are distracted by Flesh, the Displacer Beast begins to move towards us. Starting to get worried, we move our Hunter's Mark onto it to start shredding it. With another round of flesh tanking, we're able to take out the Displacer Beast, and after that it's just the Maragons and us. And while they do have two attacks per turn that deal decent damage, we're officially not stressed. Until I noticed they had advantage on their attacks against us for some reason. Flash also bites the dust right after our turn ends, so we take a moment of silence for a lot. Wait, never mind, no, Soft doesn't care about this. Either way, we cram ourselves into the corner of this arena and start pelting them from a distance while they burn through our spell slots as we cast shield. Once we run out of spell slots, the rest of the fight is pretty one note. But we get a little spooked with the lack of shield available to us, so we down a speed potion just to make sure we don't have to do this fight again. And before too long, the Maragons are down for the count. Before we leave, we make sure to grab the Umbral Gem that they were guarding, as we'll need that in the future. Now that Flesh is out of the way, we return to Balthazar to pick a fight by casting Hunter's Mark, to which he responds by downing a potion of speed, and double ray of sicknessing us, which gives us the poison condition and breaks our concentration. We then miss one too many throws, and on his turn he cloud kills and bone chills us, which knocks us quite low, and once it ticks back to our turn again, we get gibbed by the cloud kill. Going for attempt 2, we get obliterated even faster this time, as everything that happened last time also happens again. But we also got paralyzed by one of his ghouls for an added kick in the teeth. Third time is the charm as they say though. This time around we decide to cast protection from evil and good with a spell scroll and then start the fight from the high ground. Balthazar runs away and fails to hit us at all with his rays of sickness, while the ghouls waste their turns on dashing to us. When it gets back to soft she goes all out with an action surge and speed potion, to kill this ne'er-do-well necromancer, taking all of her attacks on this turn to do so. But he does fall. After that, the ghouls are just busy work and they go down with a few more throws. Having done all the big fights in the Gauntlet of Shar that we need to, we go about doing the actual trials that we need to do to progress to where the Night Song is presumably being kept. The first trial we do is the Soft Step trial, which has our name in it, so you know it will be easy since every step we take is a Soft Step. All we need to do here is reach the end without getting caught by any of the shadows roaming about. We start sneaking inside, hop over a trap, then flip turn-based mode on to give me some more time as I search my hotbar for Misty Step. We Misty Step through a window that leads us to one last gate, then we short rest super quick to get our Misty Step back and use it again to get through the gate to get another Umbral Gem. The next trial is the self-same trial, which has us murder ourselves, rather a clone of ourselves, who's hiding in the trial. We get the drop on ourselves and before we can get a turn we take ourselves out with an action surge and I'm, I'm having an identity crisis. With that we get the umbral gem and head to trial 3. Our final trial is the faith leap trial in which we need to navigate an invisible pathway in the dark and should we fail three times we instantly die. Thankfully there's a map of the pathway on the ground right at the start. We step on the pathway and jump from platform to platform to skip a large portion of it. Then, to finish the trial, we step back onto the pathway and jump to the end to collect our last umbral gem. Now that all the trials are done, we use the gems we got to enter the depths of the gauntlet where we find an entrance to the Shadowfell that seems to lead where the Night Song is being kept. Naturally, we enter. And as we do, we see one of the most hauntingly beautiful vistas throughout the entire game. We get to the bottom of this prison and find the Night Song, who it turns out is the source of immortality for Ketherick and also the child of Salune, who has been trapped here for who knows how long. At first she thinks us a Sharan who's come to kill her on behalf of Shar, but we explain to her the situation and she tells us if we free her, Ketherick's immortality ends. We agree to do just that and the Night Song is reborn once again as Dame Aelin. 
her return strikes hope into our allies at the last light in, and we get ready to take on the end of Act 2 and raid Moonrise Towers. Showing up to Moonrise, we find that our allies have already dealt with many of the guards on the outer perimeter. They ask us what the next play is, and we tell them that Moonrise has front doors for a reason. We enter the towers and an absolutely massive fight breaks out. Way bigger than I was expecting. But on the first turn, Jahiri uses Ice Storm to cover a massive part of the arena with ice and deal solid damage. She also runs into the enemies and gets shot like 50 times, but still, good job Jahira. On our turn, we go in swinging against Sorel, hitting her for 84 points of damage with a crit, then finishing her off with our next attack before she can do a single thing. After that, all heck breaks out, with enemies and allies alike landing good blows. Unfortunately, Jahira dies due to a guiding bolt during the midst of all this. We start identifying the largest threats during this as we keep mental notes of the spellcasters and paladins since their damage potential is much higher than the rest. When it's back to us, we take out one of the paladins with Hunter's Mark and throws before they can do much more damage. More chaos gets caused in the intervening turns, with the most annoying thing being one of the enemies casting Guardian of Faith, which for some reason our allies decide should be a priority target. But when we go, we treat another paladin just like we did their buddy and destroy them while they're prone on the ice. We then action surge to take out one of the spellcasters in addition. A bunch of our allies die while trying to fight the Guardian of Faith, which just really isn't great for us. Then a big hunger of Hadar gets cast to block off the entrance that we're standing in along with our remaining allies. Inspired by our allies' headstrong charge into the darkness, we use Misty Step to hop to the other side of it and take out the person who cast the spell. Unfortunately, this also adds more enemies into initiative that were further inside the towers, one of which is the Warden, who is a menace in her own right. Realizing the odds are quickly turning against us, we start making our way back up the stairs to exit the towers and make some distance between us and our enemies. We do this for a couple rounds in a row, taking a few enemies out in the process and getting some heals in where we can. During these couple rounds, despite succeeding the saving throw, we got slowed, and our concentration also got broken on our Hunter's Mark. Given that the initiative order looks like this, we spend our turn casting Blur with a spell scroll and healing ourselves with a potion while continuing to run. They cast Hunger of Hadar to try and slow our retreat even more, but we see a platform by the side of the tower and a plan begins to form. For now though, we just throw some fire and acid since we couldn't hit with our spear. Quartermaster Tally does her best to intimidate the enemies as soft retreats, but I don't think they're quite shaken by her efforts. R.I.P. Tally, you were a real one. We keep the strategy of running and yeeting alive and well when the turn order gets back to us for the next couple rounds, and this actually goes quite well, we're able to thin out the army quite a lot. Eventually most of them do make it outside though, and outmanned, outgunned, and outleveled, we initiate our plan. We use a fly scroll that's been sitting in our inventory gathering dust to fly up to the balcony we spotted earlier, and from here, with the high ground advantage on our side, the fight becomes way easier. We spend our turns raining lightning death from on high till the enemies are thinned out to a shadow of their original army. Once there's just a few enemies remaining, we down a potion of featherfall since our fly concentration was broken, and we jump down to finish off the stragglers who dared to try and fight soft. We continue kiting and throwing and healing, and even use another scroll of blur to keep ourselves alive. And on one turn, I hit the end turn button too quick before our jabber can return to us, which was a little upsetting but the enemies were kind enough to return it for us. And sure enough, one by one, throw by throw, the enemies all fall. Until the day is won. And standing amongst the pile of corpses is soft. She is alone again. And as she looks at her bloodstained hands, she wonders to herself, is it truly worth it to be a lone wolf? Yeah, probably. Soft heads upstairs where there's a necromancer guarding the door to the roof, but she dies fast, along with her minions, and Soft continues her march up the towers. Where she finds a mortal Catholic Thorm, who's more than a little upset that one random person is destroying everything he's done. He tries to intimidate us, but Dame Aelin shows up to intimidate him right back. And with a war cry from Aelin, both her and Soft looking equally fierce head into battle. Most of the goons Cathric has for help in this fight are standard skeleton mage type guys with the exception of his undead dog and a necromancer. Naturally, we take out the necromancer first on our turn to prevent her from raising even more dead. Dame Aelin goes straight to dishing out divine destruction on the necromites on her turn while they waste their attacks on missing us. Cathric, however, uses his deadly orders feature to give his goons advantage on attacking us. 
Back on Soft's turn, she does her best to burst him down with the old yeetin' machine, but kethrick has got a ton of AC, so she's only able to land two attacks on him. Still, she does a decent chunk of damage. The goons spend more time missing us, but Kethrick frightens us with his dreadful aspect ability. Summons another goon, then deadly orders us again, which has us a little spooked. And to make matters worse, we miss our next two attacks, and... Huh? Did we just deal damage and trigger his health threshold by missing? Uh, okay, I won't look a gift Kethrick in the mouth. The cutscene that follows is kinda broken, but I assume Dame Aelin is supposed to be getting smacked around, getting recaptured before Papa Kethrick makes his great escape. But she just doesn't show up at all, so I was more than a little confused since this was my first time seeing this cutscene. With just the Necromites left, this fight is over quick, with very little danger. The experience we gained from this fight was enough to bump us up to level 7 just in time for the final showdown of the act. And with level 7 we get 8 more HP, 2 level 2 spell slots alongside 2 more spells learned, and the war magic feature, which allows us to make a weapon attack as bonus action after casting a cantrip. We will rarely use that one. For our chosen spells we take arcane lock and darkness, since I really don't know what else we would want. With that done, we jump into the Illithid colony that Catherick made his escape into and ignore everything in it, cause we're out for blood today and Soft doesn't like it when her prey, uh, enemies escape. When we arrive at the bottom of the colony, we find Kethrick talking to the other two BBEGs of this campaign, Gortash and Orin, whom together with him seem to be controlling the Absolute, which is revealed to be an Elder Brain, essentially the mama of all the Mind Flayers. After they leave, we do our best to sneak into a good spot to start the fight from, and we get spotted right as we end up in the spot we were aiming for, and we're off to the races. Final fight time. Kethrick Thorm, a Mind Flayer, some Necromites, and Intellect Devourers versus Soft and the currently imprisoned, again, Dame Aelin. We start the fight by summoning a Mage Hand with the intention of having it use the help action to free Aelin. Then we fire up the Hunter's Mark Action Surge to deal some chunky damage to the Mind Flayer, which unfortunately barely survives. Especially unfortunately since on its turn it Mind Blasts us which stuns us and breaks our concentration. But all is not lost, cause next up is the Mage Hand. And the Mage Hand can't use the help action. Okay, cool. Maybe all is lost. Our stunned turn goes by without us getting hit, Catherick wastes his turn trash talking us, and the following round also goes by without any hits, so we are still in this. We jump on over to Aelin to free her, which will be a huge help in this fight since she's immortal and that's as good as it gets for a and she got dominated by the Mind Flayer. Thankfully just for the one turn, but still, way to give a guy a heart attack. When it's our turn again, we finish off the Mind Flayer and do our best to damage Catherick a little bit more. The first bit of the fight goes by with Aelin both pulling aggro and dealing with the little guys while we spend our turns pelting down Catherick bit by bit, and occasionally using our bonus action to shove one of the little guys into the abyss. At last we take out Catherick. But I think it's one of those things where the enemy is super important, so they go out in a cutscene, cause this starts to play, and... Oh. Hmm. Oh, okay. Uh, guess we're going with JRPG progression. Time to kill a god, gang. Or a god's aspect, but that doesn't sound as cool. The fight resumes and it's time for our surprise tool from the first act. The Haste Spore Flask. Which we throw at the ground to create a cloud that whenever a creature goes inside, they get hasted for that turn. Normally not the greatest to use in a fight since enemies can walk through it, but Merkel here is too big to move out of his little hole in the ground. Which means the yeeting machine is in full force today. And oh boy is it. Merkel has quite a few abilities that worry us. For starters, the Gaze of the Dead ability, which does 48 necrotic damage and half as much on a success. Should we fail, we also get frightened. Next up on the list, he has an ability that can pull everyone in the arena towards him, and if you get too close, there's a permanent bone chill aura. Furthermore, he summons four more goons each turn, and to cap it off, each of these goons can sacrifice themselves to Merkel, which gives him the ability to cast Finger of Death, which, as the name suggests, is no bueno. Thankfully, our body is a machine that turns dice rolls into natural 20s, and on our second turn with Merkel existing, he's already on half health due to just how many hits are landing. Not so thankfully, on Merkel's turn, we get frightened, which causes us to get stuck in a spot where we can't so much as hit him. We use a scroll of protection from evil and good to get rid of the condition since the one who gave it to us is undead, as well as give all our enemies disadvantage on attacks against us. 
We move into position to land a couple more blows, but unfortunately our concentration breaks the very next turn. This makes Soft very angry, and on her next turn she turns into the lightning jabber, and she jabs and jabs and jabs until we send the god of death to an early grave, on our first attempt and without even a single finger of death casted. Good riddance, bozo. With the fight over and Soft standing victorious yet again, we loot Kethra's body and grab one of the gems we need to control the Elder Brain, the other two of which are being held by Gortash and Orin, as well as Kethric's armor. Reaper's Embrace. Reaper's Embrace is a piece of plate armor with an AC of 19 that gives us disadvantage on stealth, reduces all damage we take by 2, lets us use the Howl of the Dead cantrip once per short rest, which halves the movement speed of everyone near us if they fail a save, and allows us to toggle Reaper's Rigidity to prevent us from being moved against our will in exchange for giving us disadvantage on deck saves. We'll be using this one for a bit. Afterwards, we meet up with Aelin and Isabel who tell us that we're super cool and they'd love to hang out with us, but that sounds like friendship and Soft is not about that. So they get hit with a bugger off, which might have consequences later on. All that's left now is to head to Baldur's Gate and Act 3. Is Soft up to the challenge? Can she rid the world of the tyranny of the Absolute? And more importantly, get rid of her tadpole? Find out next time and thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video, I learned a lot editing this one and I'm still learning more every day but I'm having a ball and hope you are too. Uh, thank you also for all the support on the last video, the first video. Uh, I was completely blown away when I woke up one day and I saw it had 1000 views and now it's, uh, it's a lot more than that. Uh, and I'm just in constant shock all the time. Uh, yeah, you guys are super cool, and I love seeing you talk about tips or lore that I didn't quite get, as well as class suggestions for future runs. It's just all so awesome to see. Uh, so keep those coming, and thank you again, and have a good day.